Hello everybody, this is the Operating Systems Design course, lecture number one of the online format. Remember, we don't have an in-class session uh, for the next couple of weeks. Instead, I'm recording videos of what I would normally tell you in class or show you in class. So this is the CS621 Operating Systems Design course, lecture number one for uh, well, Tuesday's lecture. Um, and so uh, let's see, let's just do a little, uh, little housekeeping here. Uh, take a look at the schedule. Uh, during the last uh, class meeting, I went over the midterm exam results. And so that was um, around, um, well, we had the midterm on 3-5, and uh, last week was this week here, 3-10 and 3-12. On 3-10, we had a class meeting on Tuesday. I went over the results of the midterm, gave you the right answers, um, discussed uh, where some of the common pitfalls occurred, et cetera, and so forth. If you did not res if you did not show up to class, I uh, yesterday emailed everybody a PDF scanned copy of the remaining exams that I had left. So you should have received that by email. If you did not receive an email with your scanned exam, um, it means I have your wrong email address or there's something wrong with the cyberspace. Long story short, you need to contact me if you still have not gotten your um, midterm exam back yet. Um, so if you have an individual question with those, I'm not on campus for office hours. Instead, you're going to need to send me an email message and set up an appointment or give me a phone call or text me or something. Contact me and uh, we'll, we, we will arrange a time to speak about your midterm. Okay, so we did not have class on Thursday, 312. The university canceled. Uh, canceled the class. So this lecture is the one for Tuesday 317. Um, and so that's where we're picking up starting in week nine, we're picking up and we're having a lecture online. Okay, so we are not, I wouldn't say we're behind. I rearranged the schedule a little bit and I'm so glad I did uh, because um, prior to the midterm, I moved ahead and I demonstrated the kernel modules and assignment number three, I believe, was on the kernel modules. Uh, no, actually assignment number four is on the kernel build module. Let me just take another look and refresh my memory on the assignments. Um, let's take a look here. Assignments, uh, so number three, I believe, was the signals. Uh, the, yes, programming was signals. Uh, and number three has been due already. That one was due um, last Thursday. You have seven days grace on it, so if you're still working on it, um, I would finish it up soon. Maybe this week would be a good time for that. And I've already gone over that assignment. It's on the signals and signal and handling the signals. If you remember, there's a lecture called signals.ppt. If you're having problems trying to figure out how to do the signals and the signal handlers, that would be an excellent lecture to look at. For assignment number four, I moved the schedule around a little bit, and I'm so glad I did, uh, because assignment number four is on the um, Hello World kernel module. So creating and compiling a Unix kernel module. I demonstrated this in class using a Ubuntu system with VirtualBox. The instructions in the assignment, if you've missed that class meeting, the instructions in the assignment are a bit different than what I did in class. Although they're very similar, um, I just did it live for you so you could see how it works. Um, I also demonstrated, and well, we went over the assignment a bit. I also demonstrated how to compile it, how to run it, how to insert it into the kernel, um, how to load the module, how to unload the module, um, how to look for it with dmessage. If you remember that lecture, hopefully you took some notes on it. Um, you don't want to call the module module. You want to call it something else like my module. And what you're doing is a hello world module. If you were in class for that lecture, and if you remember the steps for it, um, you can use the files that I gave you instead of creating your own. So if you go into the examples folder and you can see the kernel build instructions. So I actually did this on February 21st. So it wasn't, it wasn't that long ago. Um, the instructions for downloading the build essentials and all of the files you need um, to build the kernel. Also in this folder, there's a make file, this one right here. And there is a 
kernel, there's hello.c, uh, which is a kernel module, and then there's hello dot, uh, hello k dot c, another kernel module. Um, and these two here um, can be used instead of what is in the assignment, if you wish. So what you're going to do is you're going to download the files, change the hello world to something like put your name in there or something. Um, and if you, if you remember, these add different things. Uh, they add different things to the D message. Um, play around with it, experiment with it. I'm really seriously not going to know if you did this or not. Um, you don't have to send me a .ko file. You're going to send me the .c file. So when you turn it in, you're going to submit uh, the source code file to me. And it's kind of the honor system. Um, I'm not going to know if you actually did it. And there's nothing really to write with this. It's an opportunity for you to get some exposure and uh, some practice building a kernel module because one of the upcoming assignments, uh, the next one, number five, is going to have you do a little bit more with the um, with the kernel module, and you're actually going to write a device driver. So the, as number five isn't due for a while. It's hacking a Linux kernel module and accessing character devices, and it's a little bit more entailed. I'm not going to go over this one today because assignment number five is not due uh, until after the spring break. It's not due for a very long time. So what I want to do now um, is go back and cover CPU scheduling, which is chapter five or chapter six, depending upon the um, ver version of the book that you have. So we're uh, working on number three, which is the signals. Number four is the Hello World kernel module. You should be working on the Hello World kernel module and turning that in um, soon. It's not due till next week. Uh, I would have it in before the spring break um, just to be on schedule. It is highly likely that after the spring break, we're going to be back to the face-to-face -face class meetings. That's my hope on Tuesday 4-7, but I will keep you informed. So we only have a couple weeks of this um, online format, I believe, uh, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, I'm not in a hurry to get rid of it, uh, but it does require me to do a lot of extra work and trying to record and upload to, to YouTube when I would really just rather come to class and show you live. Um, but anyway, um, we're all dealing with this uh, coronavirus situation, so you know it's much safer uh, for you to watch this video at home. Okay, so on that note, uh, if you have questions with the schedule, questions with the assignments, you can go ahead and send me an email. But we're covering today, we're covering CPU scheduling, and then we're going to get into virtual memory in uh, probably next week. And I still have a little bit more on the kernel stuff to give you before assignment number five. So we're not doing assignment number five yet, but you'll, you should be doing assignment number four, which is the Hello World kernel module. And obviously, you want to finish up assignment number three, which is on those signals. Okay. CPU scheduling. Now, if I uh, were giving this lecture in class, I'd write a couple things on the board. And this is, uh, I took some notes here for what I would write on the board. And this is the nutshell of what we're going to cover when it comes to the CPU scheduling. Okay, there's five significant CPU scheduling algorithms. They are the first come, first serve, the shortest job first, which is a non preemptive scheduler. The shortest remaining time first, which is the preemptive version of it, the round robin, and then we have priority scheduling, both preemptive and non-preemptive. So these are the ones you want to be familiar with for the capstone exam. These are the ones that are tested on the capstone exam. There are three typical scheduling cues, and I'm going to go through this when I start the lecture. Um, the short-term, medium-term, and long-term queue. This is review. Uh, the Q information and the algorithms are sort of review from the undergrad class. Uh, but some people didn't get this in the undergrad class, so I'm giving you in this particular lecture, we're going over the basics of CPU scheduling. I'm not going to give you everything from the undergrad class, nor am I going to give you everything from the chapter. This is what we're focusing on. So this is what I would write on the board if I wanted you to take notes and if I wanted, and I'll upload this to the examples folder. I called it scheduling notes. I'll stick it uh, when I'm all done, because I might change a few things. I'll stick it in here 
Um, so it's, it's, it's along with the, well, actually, you know what? I'll put it in the lectures folder. I'm sorry. I'll put it in the lectures folder cause it's really lecture notes. Um, so anyway, or if you're a good student, you're probably hopefully just going to take your own notes and write that stuff down as we get to it. So the lecture that we're going to cover is called CPU scheduling, and it is literally the undergrad lecture. Uh, I want to use it as a visual aid to talk about the algorithms. And in doing so, uh, I want to talk about the things that are relevant to this class. Now, in the undergrad class, what was relevant was knowing what the algorithms were doing and why, you know, how they work and the concept of CPU scheduling. Okay, I'm going to assume that you know the basic concept, but in a nutshell, just in case it's been a while, CPU scheduling is just how it sounds. Putting together a schedule of events that's going to occur for the processing of the work on the CPU. Now, CPU scheduling also, and that's kind of a kind of a specific term when you especially when you put the word CPU in there. The more generic is just a scheduler or scheduling or process scheduling, process scheduling, thread scheduling. Um, because when there's an assumption with CPU scheduling that you're also scheduling other resources on the computer, such as um, I/O events. Um, using I/O ports, using devices, so the concept of CPU scheduling—they call it that—but it really extends past the CPU and it includes the other resources. Um, and then, and what I want to do is really talk about these queues first. So scheduling in general is usually queued. So we have multiple queues that we use in a configuration to hold the jobs because this is done asynchronously. We don't schedule work to happen synchronously because usually we only have one of each resource. For example, we're making an assumption here that we have a single CPU resource on the computer architecture. Now, if we had multiple CPUs, we'd be doing multiple CPU scheduling. Although some of you thought we've already talked about this because you answered midterm questions about multiple CPUs. We have not talked about this. Not only that, but we're assuming, and we're going to make things simpler by assuming we only have one CPU resource. Okay, so things happen and they need to be scheduled because they're happening asynchronously. So when an event happens on the kernel has to take care of the work and process the work, it's not going to drop everything and process something. Instead, it's going to create what's called a schedule. The schedule is the order, like a to-do list for how it's going to get the work done. Um, and if we can make multiple queues, then we can easily route the work so it goes to the correct resource and it doesn't have to wait in uh, behind other stuff that's not relevant. Now, there was a question on the midterm, and I know people got, got the question wrong. It had something to do with a priority scheduler that was giving higher priority to the jobs that had more work done than any of the other jobs. And it was basically describing a faulty scheduler. A faulty scheduler is one that doesn't uh, provide the correct priority to get the correct work done uh, in the correct order using the correct resources. And um, it wasn't talking about jobs sitting behind other jobs. And it wasn't even a queuing question. It was a basic question. But people read into it. And here's where I sort of want to explain. If you read into it and you got it wrong uh, because you read into it wrong, uh, I'm going to try and make an effort here to sort of correct your thinking. Okay. If we break the queues down into three categories, we have short-term, medium-term, and long-term queues. These queues are labeled before their destination. Um, so there's a couple of things that are involved here. So we're not going to have just one queue. We're going to have multiple queues. And we're going to use these queues to hold the jobs. And so the jobs actually don't even go into these cubes. They, get, they just get stamped with a label. The jobs are in the process control block or the thread control block. They sit there waiting to be processed. And really, they're not even sitting in the process control block either. They're just information about them is loaded in the process control block. So in the process control block, there's a designation for which queue, um, aka which status, the job is in. So if we mark the job with a status, aka queue, 
you know, which means we're going to queue it up. All the jobs that need short-term work, like are, that are CPU bound, they need to go to the CPU, they're going to be marked with the short-term, or like number one queue. The ones that are for I.O., for CD-ROM drive, for other ports on the computer, yada, yada, those are going to be marked long-term. The medium term is kind of a holding tank. No jobs and no work gets done in the medium term. They're on pause. So if a process has been, you know, waited and, you know, it's like, okay, you're not going to run, you're going to wait um, and we're going to avoid busy waiting. Well, then we'll put it in a medium term scheduler. Um, so it'll be sitting in the medium term queue. Um, so all jobs, when they come in to the system, they're in what's called the ready queue or the job queue. Actually, I'll even edit this here to add ready to it because uh, that's really what uh, the book says. The, the book calls it a ready queue. I call it a job queue. So you double clicked on a file. An entry was made in the process control block. It gets marked ready because that's the process state. And the ready queue, uh, which is, is really the job queue, um, holds the processes that are ready for CPU processing. All processes have to use the CPU first before they can go anywhere else. So they usually get short CPU bursts, which means they only get one or two clock cycles or so. They get a very small amount of time. And what we're trying to do is share. We're trying to share the resource among multiple processes. So one process or thread isn't going to go to the resource and hog it forever. It's going to be preempted. So to preempt something means to cut it short. To not preempt it, preempt it non-preemption, means to let it run until the job is completed and is no longer requesting the resource. So a short-term scheduling queue holds jobs that want to go to the CPU. We're going to send them to the CPU. They're going to get a little bit of CPU processing. It's going to be a short CPU burst time. And then we're going to preempt it and put the job back in the queue. And then we're going to take another job out of the queue and we're going to run that one on the CPU, and then we're going to put it back in the queue. And then we're going to take another one out of the queue, run it down the CPU, and put it back into the queue. And so the jobs are going to finish after one or two turns. It's only a thing about a queue. Think about a line at the bank where you wait in the line, you get helped, and then you go back to the end of the line, and then you get helped, and you go back into the end of the line. And the scheduling algorithms are the ones who are deciding, the algorithms that are deciding which job are we going to take out of the queue next. So CPU scheduling or scheduling in general are, you know, categorizes the algorithms that are going to be used to pull the items out of the queue, pull the jobs out of the queue. The three queues are the short term, medium term, and long term. We're going to put different algorithms on each one of these queues because they have different characteristics that are associated with them. So short terms, they're generally CPU bound processes. They're not going to get too much CPU time. The mediums, there's a holding tank. No, they're not getting any bursts at all. They're just waiting there. And then they might go between the long term. So then they get into the long term. Well, then their IO bound processes, we're not going to preempt them. And I'll talk about that in a few. Uh, and they're going to get really long burst times. So if we separate out the jobs and put them in different queues and we put different algorithms on the queues, then we have the most efficient processing going on. And remember, we're doing this because we're doing asynchronous processing. Not everybody is going to run. We have to queue everybody up because we have a lot of work to be done. And we only have one CPU or one IO resource for each one of the types that we're trying to schedule, which is the assumption. OK, let's talk about the algorithms. All right, so that's where the lecture comes into place. Now, I'm going to start at about 5.10. And I'm only using the PowerPoint to show you what these algorithms look like mentioning that there's five CPU scheduling algorithms. The first one is the easiest one. It's the first come first serve algorithm. Now, first come first serve algorithm, and what I wanna do is also write some notes in here. The order matters. So um, let's just, uh, here, I'm gonna do it down at the bottom here, actually. I'll make some, some notes here about them. So first come first, first, come, first serve. Order is important. So if you remember from the undergrad class, order is important. We have, a, we have an issue with the order. And here's a little illustration of it. 
So first come, first serve. And if you want, this is chapter five in one of the versions of the book or chapter six, it's called CPU scheduling. Not a bad chapter to read um, if your undergrad class didn't cover this. So what do we have? We have an arrival order. This is the arrival order. We have process number one, process number two, and process number three have arrived. Now in the first come, first serve, we're just taking the order and it, they came in this order and they require this amount of burst time. This is the amount, and let's just say this is a CPU scheduler. This is the amount of CPU clicks or bursts that are needed for the job to complete. So process number one needs 24, two needs three, and three needs three. And so suppose that the arrival order was in the one, two, three order. Here's a Gantt chart that shows how the processing has been performed. At time zero, process number one started. And this is, this is um, assuming a batch processing, not a continuous. So we just decided at one point we're going to stop everything. Let's process the queue in a batch. We have three jobs in the queue. Let's do it. In a continuous processing, while the jobs are running, other stuff is entering into the queue, and we're not just taking a snapshot of the queue. The queue is changing while the jobs are running. That would be a continuous, not a batch processing. So let's simplify it, make it a batch. Suppose that the process has arrived in this order. Process number one started and it went for 24 clock, clock ticks. Let's just say the burst time. And then process number two started at 24 and went for three. And then process number three started at 27 and went to 30. And then at 30, all three of the jobs ended. So we can calculate out the wait time for each one of these processes. Process number one didn't have to wait at all. It didn't wait at all because it was the first one who showed up and it was the first one who got served. Process two had to wait for 24, which is the time that process number one took. Process number three had to wait for 27, which was the combination of process number one and process number two time. So we can see the average wait time for each one of them is zero, 24, and 27. Excuse me, the wait time for each one of the processes. The average wait time, we take it all divided by three and we have 17. And so the average wait time is 17. So we can use the average wait time to compare, and that's common comparison, believe it or not, um, to compare the processes, um, excuse me, the scheduling algorithm comparisons can be used. You know, you can do average wait time to compare to see if one's better than the other. So let's suppose that the order was different and that the smaller processes came in before the bigger one did. So suppose the order was two, three, and then one came in last. So now we have the average wait time for one is six, for two is zero, and for three is three. Because this guy had to wait longer, but these guys didn't have to wait longer. So the average wait time is actually three now instead of 17. So number two and number three didn't have to wait as long. They didn't have to wait 24 and 27. So the average wait time was improved. So it's a much better than the previous algorithm. So what we want to do as a goal is minimize the average wait time. We don't really care about the individual processes. We care about the group, you know, if overall, what was the average wait time? An average wait time of three is much better than an average wait time of 17. And the difference between the three and the 17 had to do with the order that the processes arrived. So this going back to what I was saying before, order matter, order is important. Order matters because the order is gonna change the average wait time. So it changes, or it can change, oops, can change average wait time. Okay, maybe I shouldn't be typing. Okay, uh, it can significantly change it. And they call it the convoy effect, where the shorter processes are behind longer processes and they gotta wait. So we wanna put the short processes first and we wanna put the long processes second. So if we don't care about the order that they arrived, we can do this artificially. And if we do this artificially, we get the shortest job first. Oh, I have someone at my door. I'm going to pause. 
Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. I guess I don't get interrupted when I'm doing a live lecture in class. I can get interrupted when someone rings my doorbell. Okay. It was just my Amazon delivery. One of the benefits of working at home. You can buy stuff online and have it delivered and be home for it. Okay, back to shortest job first. So if we want to artificially rearrange the list and um, make it so that the shortest job first um, which means we put the, the shortest jobs. We order them in the order uh, of the quantum time, or excuse me, burst time that is necessary. So associate each process with its CPU burst time and how much it needs. There's two schemes for this one. If we do a batch processing on this and we reorder this, we're going to put the, the two that have three before the one that has 24. And we're just going to run it. So we get three ran, another three run, and then the 24 run. And this is what they call a non-preemptive. So once the CPU has given the process uh, to run, it cannot be stopped until it completes its CPU burst. Now, if, uh, for example, these two were not in the queue, uh, number two and number three hadn't arrived yet, we just started running number one, we can stop number one if another job comes into the queue that has a shorter time left on it. So, if, and that would be the preemptive version of it. So if a new process arrives with the CPU burst that is less than the remaining time of the current executing process, we preempt it. The scheme is also known as the shortest remaining time first, or the SRTF. So the shortest remaining time first shortest remaining time first is the pre preemptive version of the shortest job first. They just call it shortest remaining time first. Shortest job first is not preemptive. So we take a batch of jobs that come in and we arrange them in an ascending order with the smallest to the largest um, job requirements and we just start running them. In the shortest remaining time first, if a new job comes into the queue, we stop the one that's running if the one that's running takes more time than the one that just came into the queue. And so you can see that this is going to lead to faster processing because we're not going to be stuck processing the one that is taking 24 when a number three comes in and it doesn't require as much time. So it's the shortest remaining because there's an assumption that it's already received some CPU cycles and that its time is, is going down um, along with how, how much time it's been processing. And at one point, it might only be one or two CPU bursts, maybe larger than the one that came through. And the big question, and you know, a million dollar question is, is it worth the sacrifice? Is it worth the sacrifice of stopping it because it only has, it has one more burst you know, more to do than the one that's there. Because you also have to consider that there is switching time. There's context switching time if you're going to do it. So the shortest job first is optimal. It gives maximum average waiting time for a given set of processes. It can be better. The shortest remaining time first, depending upon how you're averaging and how you're calculating the time that's remaining, it might slow things down. So there is favoritism towards the non-preemptive version of it. The shortest job first is an easier algorithm to implement. There's no calculations that are going to be performed. We just reorder the queue, run it, and then reorder, and then run again. Um, in the shortest remaining time first, we have to preempt every time a new job comes in whose time is less than the current running job which, you know, depends on how much time really is there between the two, how much of a difference is there. So there's various different versions, and you're lucky in this class we don't actually have to worry about calculating how much time is left and doing the preemptive. And also on the capstone, you'll never have to calculate, well, you will have to calculate the preemptive time, but you won't have to come up with the strategy for it. They'll, be, they'll give it to you. So uh, they'll tell you um, what the priority is. And usually the priority is the time, how much time is left. If another job comes in and the job has um, less time than the current running job, then you're supposed to preempt it. So.
Here's an example of the non-preemptive shortest job first, where we have processes one, two, three, and four who have come in. And then we have their arrival times that we have to take into consideration. Now, the other thing too is on the capstone exam, you'll be given something very similar to this here. If you take a look at the sample questions, um, this will look familiar. Uh, the common mistake that we see graduate students do is that they start running a job before it's actually arrived. So make sure you're not running jobs, even though they're short, before the arrival time or calculating time they're taking and they haven't even arrived into the queue yet. Uh, so arrival times are important to look at and make sure. So process number one arrived at zero and then process number two arrived at one, which means nothing was happening between zero, excuse me, and two. Nothing was happening between the two, which means process number one should be running. So process number one needs seven burst time. It happens to be the largest process that came in first. And then we have another four, we have a one and we have a four. So the non-preemptive model, number one is gonna run first because it's non-preemptive and it arrived first. So it's gonna run to the seventh. It's not gonna get interrupted. And then uh, the next one is gonna be number three because it only requires one CPU burst. So it's gonna go to eight. And so it had to wait actually, but it arrived at four and it uh, at the time of four, it only had to wait for three to get to seven. So it didn't really wait that long. So if we look at the average wait time, and this is the other thing you need to pay attention to because you'll have to calculate average wait time. And if you're doing it for a non-preemptive shortest job first, you must consider the arrival time because they haven't been waiting if they haven't arrived into the queue. For example, these are the average wait times. These are the wait times, excuse me, for each one of these processes. Number one didn't have to wait, it's zero. It arrived at zero, it started at zero. Number two, arrived at two. It waited for six because it didn't have to wait for the entire seven. It only arrived at two, so it waited for six. So it started, it could have started at two. And actually, is that right? Um, let's see. Um, at the time that the process one was running at the time that two occurred, it would be five. Uh, it arrived at two, uh, but it didn't, oh no, it didn't run until after this one ran. So it, it was three. Okay, so it had to wait for process number. Well, actually, if you draw it out on a Gantt chart, you can actually kind of see process number two. Uh, so you take the time that it was running and you minus the time that it was waiting. Uh, so let's see, process number three had to wait three. So process number three arrived at four. That one makes sense. Um, seven minus four, three. This one here, I think is slightly off here. We got five plus one. Oh no, it waited for six. Yeah, this one's correct. It arrived at five. There was five left seven minus two for five, plus it had to wait for this guy to run, which was one, so it turned up to be six. It waited for six. Number three didn't arrive till four, uh, so that, that that that's, so it has three from seven, so three, because it ran next, so three. And then number four arrived at five, um, and then subtract out what was running before it, and you get seven actually for that one. So five, what do we have at five? This guy was still running. So we had two left for here. Then we had three and then we had four for seven. So if you run through the logic and I highly recommend doing this because you'll need to calculate this. This is the average wait time for the non-preemptive shortest job first. And so we come up with four. So if we compare, compare that with the preemptive, we could have an effect where it actually takes more time if we can start considering the context switching. So here's an example, and this is the same numbers as before. So let's compare the non-preemptive shortest job first with the preemptive shortest job for first, which is the shortest remaining time first. So this is the shortest remaining time first, even though the slide says it's preemptive, well, it is the preemptive shortest job first, which is shortest remaining time first. 
we see we save, if we just look at the calculations, we save one, we go down. So we had four was the average wait time. Now the average wait time is three because we preempted the first job. So the first job came in and it gets allowed to run till two because the second job didn't arrive till two. So which we means we have five left. So eventually at the end, we're gonna run the five for, for the, for the um, process number one. Process number two comes in and it runs for four. Uh, and the but process number three comes in and it's one, so it's gonna preempt. So we see the order goes from process one to two to three to two to four to one. Because we calculate out, and some people like to put it like on the right hand side. You'll just keep a note. This only has five left. This only has, you know, so many left. And then you can figure out which one goes next with which one is the shortest burst time. So shortest remaining time left goes next. And so the order, and you'll write it out like this on the capstone, and you'll calculate it out like this. And you're calculating the average wait time the same way we just did a few minutes ago on this one. Uh, but you do need to keep track of how much remaining time is left. And that's where I recommend writing, just cross this out and put five here, cross this one out. And, you know, you can keep a live total of what you have remaining left. Because what you don't want to do is screw up how much time you have remaining, and then you've got the whole calculation done incorrectly. Um, and you will have to write this. You will have to calculate this. And the final exam for this course is will also for this course will also give you some uh, practice calculating this as well. So we'll give some practice problems. So that is the preemptive version of the shortest job first. I call it the shortest remaining time first. I'm giving it, but it's really a shortest remaining. It was the preemptive version of shortest job first. Okay. Round robin. Round robin. Uh, I don't know if this one comes next. Let's see if it does. We're not going to do the averaging. Let's go to round robin. I did mine in a slightly different order than uh, than uh, the slide set does it. Uh, I'm only using the slide set to illustrate the algorithms, by the way. You don't have to know everything in that chapter. It's the undergrad chapter. So, Round robin. Round robin. What is round robin good at? Round robin is good at one particular thing that is very, very important. It's very responsive. So this is very, very responsive. All processes will get an opportunity to run regardless. So one of the things we haven't talked about yet is uh, some of the side effects of what happens. So in the first come first serve, it's fairly, it's fair, you know, to the most part. Uh, the order matters. The big job comes in, the average wait time, you know, might suffer from the convoy effect. And the shortest job first, it's giving priority to the shorter jobs and they're gonna bit run first before the longer jobs run. And if we really wanna tweak it, we can make it into a better form and do the shortest remaining time first and preempt those long jobs if uh, a short job comes in that's really small. Um, we should let that one run. Um, but some jobs are going to have to wait longer than other jobs, and the waiting time is not equal between all of the jobs. Some of the jobs are going to wait longer than some of the other jobs because priority has really been given to the jobs that have the shortest amount of time requirement. In the round robin, there is no there is no such thing as how much how much time the jobs need. Instead, what we're looking at then is giving everybody a little bit of time and just going around in a circle. So process number one, it gets two clock ticks or the, they call them quantums actually, time quantums. You get a small amount of CPU time. It's generally uh, between 10 and 100 milliseconds. You get a little, you know, a couple of clock ticks. Now the quantum time can be adjusted with the size of the queue and the average time it takes for each one of the jobs. So if each one of the job requires 10 CPU cycles, and we start with a quantum one, and we give everybody one, and we go back, and we give everybody two, and we go back and give everybody three, it's gonna take a long time. But if we give everybody five, then we're just only gonna take two cycles. So the quantum needs to be adjusted and uh, with a what they call a moving average, with how what's the average time needed so that all jobs can get the fewest number of cycles necessary to complete in the shortest amount of time. So with that, you don't want to make the quantum too big because if you make the quantum too big, then you got a first come first serve. 
So what you're trying to do is get all the jobs, get a little bit of attention. So jobs that are good for round robin scheduling, uh, round robin is very responsive and it's basically very good for user interface design. Um, so UI controls, UI, uh, user interface, um, graphics, um, something where you want it all to finish and you want it to, to, you want the illusion that everything is loading at the same time and everything's running simultaneously. So for UI effects, for responsiveness, so uh, we know that something is running and it gives the user the illusion that everything is running and it's running quick. So UI responsiveness, and when I click on something, I want it to, I want it to show that I've clicked on it. Round Robin is good for that. So the performance, if the queue is large, it's very similar to first come, first serve. If the queue is small, then the, um, the quantum must be large with respect to the context switching. Otherwise, the overhead is too high. You have lots more context switching, which I probably should add to this here. Uh, let's, go, let's go here. Lots of context switching. So we don't want to have too much context switching because if we do, then if you add up, then we're not really calculating context switching in any of these algorithms, but if we do take that in, into consideration, then we're going to add up a lot of extra context switches because we're constantly switching between the different um, running jobs and we're not letting anything finish. We're just giving like two quantums to everything or three or something. So we are a lot more context switching going on there. But we get responsiveness. Each job gets to run, or it's not going to get. It's not going to stay in the queue for a very long time. Um, so the jobs themselves will all get attention instantly. It's like someone coming to a line at the bank. You have a huge queue of twenty people at the bank, and someone comes up to the line and says, "What do you need? What do you need? What do you need?" It goes through each one of the people and gives them a little bit of time. Oh, I need to do a deposit. Oh, I'm trying to do a withdrawal. Oh, I'm trying to do something else. Um, so when you're doing that, everyone is getting some attention. And so you don't feel like, oh, wow, I haven't talked to anybody yet. And I've been here for 20 minutes. I'm standing in a queue. So it's responsiveness is the important part with that one. So here's an example of the round robin with a time quantum of 20. And uh, the burst times that are required are 53, 17, 68, and 24. You can see that there's a variance, there's a huge variance between the amount of burst time that's needed for each one of these. So this algorithm is also better suited for jobs of similar, similar burst times. Um, it gets better performance with similar burst times. So. So typically a higher uh, average turnaround time than the shortest job first, but better responsive, better response to the system and a lot more context switching going on. You see a lot more switching and a context switch is where you're going to switch from one process to another. So we got lots of context switching going on with this one. And so here's the time quantum and the context switch time in comparison. If we set the quantum to 12, and the process time needed 10, there's no context switching. If we set the quantum to six, then there's one switch. If we set it to one, then there's nine switches. So there's a fine line with how many context switches you really want to implement because that's going to waste your time. A context switch, when that occurs, nothing else is happening. The CPU, the, everything is, is spending time context switching and not getting any real work done. So it's not the most optimal thing. Um, and here's a turnaround time that varies with the time of the quantums, uh, the quantum time as well. Depending upon how large you've made the quantum, the average turnaround time could be compared with the first come first serve, um, which is kind of typical. Okay. This lecture kind of goes through the multi-level feedback. You don't have to know that for this class. That's the undergrad class, real time scheduling, thread scheduling, a bunch of, uh, thread uh, related concepts, you don't have to know that either. There's one algorithm that's missing. It is, uh, eh, let's see, it's, it's close to the optimal here. Uh, and the optimal is not in here either. Okay, so this lecture is missing, and I have to explain this to you. Um, there's two algorithms that are sort of missing. What's called the priority? Um, there's another one called the optimal algorithm. And uh, I'm going to pull out another sheet for you that's going to go through the optimal and the priority. 
So I am going to pause this video momentarily one more time um, and then uh, show you something interesting. Okay, I'm back and I'm glad I paused it because I couldn't find what I was looking for and it took me a few minutes. Um, so I didn't waste your time. So um, in the, uh, and I just put this in the folder because it wasn't there. So uh, refresh your folder if you were there a few minutes ago. But if you go into the 621 class from my website, CS621, go into lecture notes, refresh, refresh the folder uh, because I just loaded it in here. There's a new folder here called sample exam questions, sample exam questions. Click on sample exam questions and you have the, I put everything in here. We have some stuff for page replacement that's going to be needed for you. Uh, these are capstone uh, questions that have to do with CPU scheduling and page replacement algorithms. Uh, but right now we were going to look at this one here. It says CPU scheduling algorithms. So if you click on the CPU scheduling algorithms, this one actually has the five algorithms in it. Um, and so I can use this. So we, remember we, we talked about for a few minutes ago, the first come first serve scheduling algorithm. And in here we have, uh, this is the same as lecture 24, three and three, and it shows you how to do the, how to calculate it, the average wait time. And then the second Gantt chart here, if you rearrange the jobs, shows you the uh, shortest uh, first come first serve with the convoy effect. And then we have the shortest job first scheduling algorithm. This is what we just went through a minute ago. And these are better notes for you for review. Although the uh, averaging is done slightly differently than it is in the other lecture, uh, the numbers are the same. It's just that the approach is different, slightly different than what I uh, just showed you. And then we come down a little bit further. We have the priority scheduler. This is what's missing from the undergrad textbook is the priority scheduling. All right, so let's talk about priority scheduling. Priority scheduling is just like the shortest job first, but instead of using the job time, you're gonna use an artificial priority time. So again, priority scheduling is just like shortest job first or shortest remaining time first, but it's the priority which is an artificial number you're gonna stick on the job, not the job time or the shortest remaining time left. So the priority is a more general case of the shortest job first. So each job is assigned a priority and you run the jobs with the highest priority first. And then there's the preemptive and there's the non-preemptive version of it. And so in this lecture, we've got, for example, a Gantt chart here based on the process first times and the priorities. So we have process one, two, three, four, five. The burst times are different. The priorities are different. Now in a question like this, they're gonna tell you the scale. They're gonna say that number one is the higher priority than number two, higher than number three, et cetera. And so you're gonna schedule them based on their priorities using the same concept. And so if a higher priority process comes in while a lower priority process is running, you're gonna preempt it. Um, essentially. Uh, if you're doing a print -a version of it. If you're not, you're just going to let the higher priority process wait for the one that's currently running to stop and then you're going to rearrange the queues so that the next highest priority is running next. So in here, and I thought it was in here, maybe it's at the bottom, uh, the optimal is explained. Um, no, I don't see the optimal in here either. I'm going to have to find you more information on the optical. This is a two part lecture anyway. Uh, so optimal is actually not even part of my list here. And it's really the optimal. So the opt, okay. So let me tell you about the optimal. You can't implement it. You know, <laughs> optimal says, okay, here, here's how optimal works. If I were to look into a crystal ball and if I were to predict in the future, which, which job is going to come in and which, how we're going to do it. And so optimal actually plays a part with memory management as well. And there's an optimal algorithm for memory management that is, it gives you a benchmark, but the optimal scheduling for CPU scheduling, nobody implements it. It's not testable on the capstone and nobody's even going to talk about it because it, 
It's a predictive scheduler, and it's the same concept as the memory management optimal page replacement algorithm. It says, if we were looking at a crystal ball and we're going to predict the future, and we, we had a system that we could totally predict, this is how we would schedule it. Okay, how are you going to do that? Are you going to tell the user you have to click on this program before that program, and you have to run it this way and that way? So if you're running with a modern day CPU scheduler for modern interactive and for an interactive um, environment where the user can run anything they want, any time that they want, there's no such thing as optimal. Optimal can't be used. Priority can be used. And priority gives you in both the preemptive and the non-preemptive variety. Optimal is not going to work, and not for memory management and not for CPU scheduling. Um, they do test optimal for memory management because it can be used for benchmarking with memory management. It can't be used for anything in the CPU scheduler. Now you could run optimal, for example, for a CPU scheduling algorithm, it's predictive scheduling. You could run it if it were a microwave oven and you knew that the user is gonna have to enter in the numbers before they press the power, the start, the stop. Yeah, yeah, and then are, do you really need to schedule it at that point? No. So there's no need for a scheduling algorithm if you're already going to determine the order that everything's going to run in. So let's just forget about optimal. And then when we get to the memory management section, I'll talk about the optimal memory management algorithm. That one is not implementable again for different reasons. But the other thing too is that, you know, um, it's a nice benchmark. So we don't really have a benchmark that we can use it for with CPU scheduling. So in here, you'll see run through, uh, I know I've been probably get, making guys dizzy going up and down with this. Um, you'll see the run through on the first come first serve explanation. Go ahead and read through this at a slower pace. The shortest job first, the shortest remaining time first, the priority scheduler. The priority schedule, scheduler is just the same as the, um, as the shortest remaining time or the shortest job. It's just using an artificial priority number instead of the time that the job takes. And there's a preemptive and there's also a non-preemptive. It goes by the same name. Okay, a few notes on round robin. Round robin is also explained in here. Its scheduling is very similar first come first serve, except the CPU bursts are assigned. Um, they're not the, the ones the process needs. They're, everyone's given the same amount and creates better responsiveness and uh, the jobs can can finish uh, usually. And you, when you look at the Gantt chart for a for a round robin, they all get the same number of bursts. Now, the mistake people make with the round robin is, let's say the that P1 and P2 and 3P, are, let's say these three are being scheduled, and you make the quantum uh, one, or actually we'll make it two. So 24 minus two, this guy's gonna have 22 left. This guy is going to have one. This guy's going to have one left after the first cycle. And so the second cycle comes through. It's still two, but there's only one left here. So you preempt it. You, it, it doesn't, the CPU doesn't sit there and go two, even though it only needs one. So the one exception to the round robin is although you're giving everybody equal time and everyone's getting the same amount of time, if the process doesn't need it, then the process isn't going to use it. Um, it, it will preempt. And so you don't have to worry about there not being, um, you know, the process not needing all the time it's getting, it's not going to waste time. So if you read through the notes, you'll get a better explanation. Um, you know, this is the same thing out actually out of the lecture that, uh, I just showed you. So also in here, if you look at the uh, PDF files here, you'll see, uh, this is, a uh, memory management, you'll see, oh, this looks like the memory management part. This is gonna be for memory management. Uh, let's see, let's look at this one here. <laughs> Producer consumer, uh, no, no, no. <sighs> okay, let's see, I know one of these is gonna have, ah, here it is, this is what I was looking for. Uh, nope. Mm. No, no, Baker's algorithm. No, ah, here we go. This is what I wanted. Number two. So I just clicked on uh, the 2018 fall capstone 
systems exam. Question number two says, consider two CPU, and I want to give you a sample of what these questions look like. Consider two CPU scheduling algorithms for a single CPU. They will always be for a single CPU. Preemptive shortest job first, also known as shortest remaining time first, and the round robin. And assume that no time is lost during context switching. Very unrealistic, but how are you going to measure it? It's impossible to measure it, so you don't have to measure it. Given the four processes with the arrival times and the expected CPU time listed below, draw a Gantt chart to show when each process executes using number A, the round robin. They're going to give you a time quantum. You never have to calculate it. So time quantum four. And if you look in the book there, you'll see that there's ways of doing an averaging of the quantum and there's calculations that you could perform on the quantum to, to create the optimal quantum time. Uh, don't worry about it. That's a waste of your time. Uh, they'll always give you the quantum for the round robin. And then uh, the preemptive shortest uh, job first uh, for part B, only calculate the average turnaround time. So you have to do the average turnaround time for part B. And so in here, you'll draw out the Gantt. And when it says draw out the Gantt charts, that's what this is here. These are Gantt charts. So you'll draw something like this. I don't like to do the whole box. I'll just put a line and I'll just put zero and then I'll put P1. And I put the numbers like P1 underneath the line. So you'll, you'll get familiar and, and don't wait until the capstone, the day of the capstone to draw a Gantt chart. Practice drawing Gantt charts for these particular scenarios uh, so you know what you're doing. So, and these have got like the, the deadlock stuff in it. I think there's another one in here too. Oh, here's another one. Oh, that's the page replacement algorithm. Uh, oh, what do we got here? Here we got question number two. Suppose the following jobs arrive as indicated for scheduling on a single CPU. Assume that no time is lost during context switching. And then we have jobs that are labeled A, B, C, D, and E. And we have some arrival time and we have some to quantum time needed, or excuse me, a CPU time. And then we have priorities. Look at that, we have gold, bronze, silver. And then, uh, and here's an example of the Gantt chart, what it might look like. You're gonna draw a Gantt chart and showing the, uh, the scheduling of these uh, jobs. And then you're gonna be asked a couple of questions about it. And uh, one of them you might be asked is, uh, you know, for nine points, do the round robin quantum four and assume that all jobs have already arrived. Okay, so you don't have to do any preemption on that if they've already arrived. And then uh, maybe uh, here you got a preemptive priority scheduler. And then what is the average wait time for the preemptive priority scheduler? So what you're looking at then is average wait time. If I were a smart student, I'd know how to do average wait time. Uh, so practice doing average wait time as well. Um, this is the priority, this is the round robin. And as I mentioned before, the five algorithms you really got to pay attention to are these guys here. They're the only ones they test you on. I, in fact, those are the most popular ones, actually. Uh, so let's see. Uh, what have I left out? Um, I think this is pretty good for the introduction. Um, I think what we might do, uh, I might have another follow-up lecture to this. I haven't decided what I want to do for Thursday's class um, yet. Uh, but we might... Uh, I might run through some more examples with you. Um, I'd like some feedback, if you have feedback. Um, given uh, the style, given the way this is being recorded and how this is working, if you have some suggestions, comments, concerns, or anything, uh, you can send me an email message and say, hey, I like the format. Hey, I don't like the format. Can you talk a little louder? Can you stop taking breaks and pausing it? Um, I don't know. Can you give us a little bit more practice with this? Can you do this? Can you do that? Um, I'm totally open to feedback. And uh, again, this will get better. I think I'm not used. To, I've been totally out of the recording business for a while. Um, it'll get much easier and I'll ramble less as we move forward and I start doing this more often. And so hopefully the sound quality is good enough for you. And um, I will take and post this um, as soon as I stop the video, I will post this to the uh, same folder. I will put it in the uh, sample exams folder. So you'll have this little cheat sheet that has the uh, scheduling notes with the five algorithms. They never ask you about the cues. I put this stuff in here for the cues just to, 
uh, just to help you a little bit. In fact, this here, you know, I'll just take this. I'll clean this up a little bit. I probably could just do this on my own time. Uh, all right, so next time I'll have another video for you for Thursday. And uh, what I'm going to do then is move on to another topic. So um, if you do have a suggestion, you want to want, because you can't raise your hand right now and, and, and say something. So email is the, the way you're going to say it. Um, so email me, let me know what, uh, what, you, what you did when you raised your hand or what, what questions you have, and I will address them. I will either address them personally with you or in a you know, follow-up video. So I hope you're staying safe and you're staying dry and you're washing your hands and you're staying healthy. And I will see you for another video uh, very soon. So have a good day.